פחות. Okay, just check in chat, yeah. Okay, and then what I'll do is I'm going to share my uh, screen. Um, so if anyone has any questions, if they could just, uh, just unmute and ask any questions as we go along. I know it's a lot more difficult to actually do this, but uh, if there's anything that you're not quite uh, getting, then, uh, then just, just uh, unmute and uh, and I should be able to, to hear uh, from you. Uh, I'll, I'll check the chat uh, every, every now and then, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll probably not be looking at that uh, too often. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen. That's probably the easiest way to set things up. Okay, so hopefully everybody can actually see uh, that. Okay, so in, in this uh, in this presentation, we're going to have a look at uh, some some blockchain and uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, have a look at basically what the address uh, means, how we use our our key pairs, as we've seen with uh, with public key encryption. In this case, we'll be using elliptic curve uh, cryptography because RSA is not really fit for a, a blockchain type uh, network. We're looking at what makes up a blockchain, a public blockchain, and how important mining is. Then we'll go on to look at uh, Ethereum and how Ethereum uh, implements smart contracts. We'll do a little bit about some of the cryptography used in, in blockchain. And then finally, uh, we'll have a look at, at really uh, something that uh, we use quite often, and that's uh, uh, Hyperledger. Okay, so here, here we are. Uh, so we're uh, continuing uh, on uh, with, with our, our focus. Uh, we're on week 10. So hopefully most of you will have had some feedback on your test. Uh, I'll have a Monday session this week again if you want to get in contact, but we'll, we'll probably focus mainly on the coursework. Uh, I can have one-to-one -one sessions after uh, that if anybody uh, wants. Uh, hopefully, uh, you'll know where you stand uh, with, the, uh, with, with your assessments. Okay, next week we'll do some future cryptography and then we'll go on to tokens, authorization and Docker and week 13, uh, doesn't actually uh, exist because we have a holiday in, in that week. Okay, so our still our focus is on uh, week 14 and week 15. Uh, on the Monday session, I'll explain a bit more in detail what happens with those as uh, those uh, as assessments. Okay, anybody any questions on where we are and what we're doing? Good. Okay, well, you might wonder what that is. Does anybody want to make a guess what that photograph is? It's a Merkle tree. Yeah, it's a Merkle tree. Okay, a Merkle tree. And that's what a Merkle tree actually uh, looks like. Uh, Ralph Merkle uh, created this amazing uh, uh, discovery. Uh, uh, an uh, invention of what's called a, a, a Merkle tree. And really when anyone talks about uh, Bitcoin and blockchain and distributed ledgers and so on, uh, all there is underneath is some sort of structure, the Merkle tree, which allows us to very quickly uh, define the trustworthiness of the transactions that we uh, add. If you think about it, everything is a transaction everything we do in life there's a transaction of something going to something else for a certain transaction uh, amount with uh with uh, blockchain and uh, distributed ledger technology what we have is transactions which are signed by an entity and by signing i mean that is signed by the private key and we can prove with some sort of public key uh, uh, structure so with the Merkle tree, what we have is that we have blocks that, that we create. 
and each block has within inside them uh, a number of, uh, of transactions. So in this case, the, the Merkle tree starts with the hash of uh, our, our, our values. We then merge uh, the hashes together, uh, two together, uh, to, to create the next level, and then hash again, and then hash again, until we get uh, a, a hash of the, the complete uh, block. So in this way, we can tell if anything has been changed or if anything is within inside the, the Merkle tree. Each block themselves is then hashed so that we get a current hash and we hash back to the previous block and contain that within the current block and we will create a pointer uh, to the next, the hash of the next block. In this way, it is all interconnected and it is uh, almost impossible for us to be able to trick the system to add something that isn't actually uh, valid. Okay, so it's this, the root of uh, blockchain technology really is uh, 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 defined uh, with this type of uh, structure. So something came along, and it's 11 years old uh, now, something came along uh, about 11 years ago, and it was created by this person here. So that's Satoshi Nakamoto, and he, he uh, created a, a white paper, and it really laid out the concepts of uh, distributed uh, currency. And it used public key uh, encryption, uh, he worked with uh, this, this uh, uh, person uh, uh, here uh, to, to be able to create the first version. It was actually, uh, it was created on Windows XP of, of all uh, systems, uh, but uh, they, they communicated and they created the first version of the, of the cryptocurrency. And this is what's called the Genesis block here. So the Genesis block is block zero of the Bitcoin uh, network. As we'll find, uh, each block has miners and the miners are rewarded for actually uh, 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 creating the, uh, uh, the block with the transactions in a trustworthy way. So in Bitcoin, the miners all compete. They know the reward. In this case, it was 50 uh, Bitcoins. And whoever manages to get the hash value, so the hash value is defined here, and have a look here, you'll see that that hash value starts with a whole lot of zeros. So in this case, the challenge was to find a nonce value, a salt value, that when added to all the transactions would reveal a, a hash value which had a certain number of zeros at the start. That's quite difficult because we've got to keep trying and trying and we can only really do that with the GPUs and, uh, and parallel processing and to keep trying. So eventually one of the nodes will uh, eventually find a nonce value and then uh, they will broadcast to the network and the miners will give up and agree that uh, this is the right hash for, for it. Okay, so as we'll find uh, this reward value has changed. So we, we take a reward of 50 Bitcoins initially and every so often the way that Nakamoto uh, des des designed it was that uh, the reward will reduce and the amount of cryptocurrency will actually reduce uh, too. So there's only a finite amount of cryptocurrency and then once it's all gone, then there's no more. There'll be uh, no more uh, new uh, uh, coins created. Just now, I think we're at 12.5 uh, Bitcoins. But in May time, it will drop again and uh, the miners will be re rewarded less for, uh, the, um, for that, that process. Okay, so that's that's the the genesis block uh, that uh, that we have uh, in there, and the work uh, was really uh, part of the 
the, the cyberpunk uh, uh, movement, which was created by Eric Hughes, Tim May, and John uh, uh, Gilmore. And they promoted uh, the, the usage of this, this cryptocurrency. And it was especially against, at the, at the time, uh, the, the banks were often profiteering uh, against, uh, against citizens. So they were reigning against uh, this type of movement and looked towards uh, a currency network which uh, took the control of currency out of the hands of, uh, of countries. And each node themselves has, can have a copy of the, uh, the whole Bitcoin network. It's, it's larger than 150 gig uh, at, at the current time. So that the way it works is that as long as there's one copy of the, 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 the Bitcoin network or the blockchain, then it can replicate itself. So it, there's a consensus across all the nodes as to the current state of the network. If you want, they can store uh, all of the transactions that, uh, that are involved so that it's not centralized like our existing uh, network infrastructure. So this is the paper here uh, that uh, Nakamoto uh, created. I highly recommend that you read it. It's a very readable uh, paper and exactly what he set out, he or she, sorry, <laughs> set out is exactly what has come into practice and it's not actually changed that much since the original uh, creation. In blockchain tech technology, we have what's called a hard fork and a soft fork. With a hard fork, we actually create a new blockchain which forks off the main one. In a soft fork, we get all the miners and some consensus to agree to a new way of actually setting things up. So that will typically go back to, a, to the GitHub and the software which is in there will actually define the new uh, setup. As we'll see, there's been cases of a hard fork. You don't really want to create a hard fork if you can uh, avoid it because it, it kind of changes the whole consensus and everyone must agree to follow the new hard fork um, or, or, or not. Okay, so this was, uh, this was uh, Eric Hughes, uh, Tim May and uh, and John Gilmore, who really promoted uh, this, this type of thing. And underneath, it was the usage of public key encryption that was at its core. Not RSA, uh, but uh, elliptic curve uh, cryptography, and everything started to become much more uh, trustworthy. So some say that he is, uh, <coughs> is Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, but it's actually been proven that uh, he's not. What maybe happened was that this person did live in the area that, uh, that the possible inventors uh, of uh, Bitcoin uh, was included, but possibly they looked up the yellow pages and found the name and then put that person's name uh, onto, the, onto the paper. But no one quite knows and no one has revealed uh, the private key which relates to the initial uh, mining. So the initial transactions and the reward for them are, is still waiting in an account for someone to actually reveal that private key and claim uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Bitcoins. Okay, and uh, some people claim to be uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. So that this was sent on uh, the 1st of April. So. Uh, uh, hopefully it was a it was a joke uh, tweet, and it's quite a profitable uh, industry for for some because it's almost like the perfect crime. Uh, if someone manages to get your private key, then they can then sign uh, transactions for you, and it will be re uh, revealed. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to to be able to get the Bitcoins uh, back or the cryptocurrency back again. So it's almost like a perfect uh, a crime. So there have been attacks against the wallet. Uh, so there has been uh, previous attacks 
where uh, you can get an online service to create a, a wallet for you. If when creating that wallet, they take, they take a copy of the seed or the private key value, then they can actually, um, uh, at some future time, uh, uh, clean your, your wallet out of, uh, of, of cryptocurrency. So it's a big, a big worry and you really need to watch your, your, your wallet and probably you're looking to set up your, your, uh, uh, your, your wallet so that you have multi-factor authentication. Uh, probably you're looking at an offline wallet where you store your keys uh, on, on a, in a paper format, in a paper wallet uh, and so on. Uh, it's not possible to take the public key or the, the derivation of it and create the private key at the current time, but obviously with quantum computing methods, that may actually happen. Okay, so there are many hacks that uh, have happened typically in exchanges where people are storing wallets. Uh, when ICOs uh, uh, be for, for, for cryptocurrency offerings, uh, one hack was uh, if if uh, there was there was a, a cryptocurrency investment round five minutes before uh, the the round was to go ahead then if someone knew who the investors were they would send them a link to say please transfer the cryptocurrency for the offering to this account here uh, and then they sent it to the to the wrong uh, account so obviously it's a it's a difficult uh, area and uh, and often uh, an intruder will look for certain files, uh, do a certain scan on servers, on uh, hosts and so on. For these files here, wallet.dat, wallet.dat.zip uh, and, and, and so on. If they can find these, there's a good chance they'll be able to open up the wallet, say with uh, something like Hashcat, and to be able to reveal uh, the keys uh, inside it. This is an example of a scan that was seen on a real uh, site uh, that, uh, that uh, had uh, wallets on it. And you can actually see the continual requests for uh, certain uh, key files uh, and wallet.dat uh, especially, you, you can see there. Okay, and uh, so it's well known that uh, people will, will scan for these types uh, of, of accounts. Does anybody have any questions up to now? No, no, good. Ah, sorry, I've got my I've got my crypto crypto t-shirt on. By the way, if you, if you see the, uh, right, okay. So, so what we're seeing now is is a is a real change of uh, of of the way that that we transact. So we really need to understand what it means to own something, what it means to own a car. So in the future, we will probably see what are called crypto assets. So those are signed assets that say that I own something. If I want to sell you a car, then I'll transfer that asset to you in a, in a trusted uh, way. And if you hold that asset uh, and it's been signed by me, the previous owner, then you now own that. So we need to understand what ownership really means, what consent means, uh, what physical borders actually mean anymore, because in a, in a Bitcoin, a blockchain world, then it's very difficult to find laws and regulations and so on. Obviously, companies need to operate with inside the borders and so on, but someone who sets up a company in Luxembourg, say it's probable that uh, those laws will, will, will apply. But it's very difficult to really regulate within, uh, in, within a cryptocurrency world. And whose laws do you comply with uh, when you transact on the internet? Uh, are you operating with Californian laws or EU laws uh, and, and, and so on? And every transaction that we make is probably differs in some sort of way. And really, why does fiat currency even exist? Uh, it's, it's an ancient form of controlling economies uh, and really we need to understand why we even need uh, the concept of a, of a fiat currency. And really the core uh, 
core understanding of, of, uh, of what our rights are to, to privacy. So the main generations that we've seen uh, 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 blockchain DLT type technology gone through is first generation uh, Bitcoin, a very poor uh, uh, methods used, uh, high, high transaction fees, uh, consume proof of work is used and uh, can consume vast amounts of electrical energy. Uh, so really this first generation is not actually very good. Second generation is things like Ethereum, where we brought along uh, smart contracts uh, to add in trustworthy pieces of code that could be trusted to transact and, and keep a, a, a state running for, for a, a, a transaction. And then the third generation, we're looking at what are called uh, direct uh, acrylic graphs. In this way, we can actually create chains of uh, transactions. And IOTA is a good example uh, of this and where we get instant consensus. Because what we want is that uh, a piece of data from a sensor, uh, a heart rate sensor, there is a consensus to know that that data is actually correct. So with the older ones, with uh, Bitcoin, we're looking at eight to 10 minutes before a consensus can be created. Within third generation, we can uh, reduce that well down to less than a, than a second. So we know exactly what our networks uh, are. And the third generation is really focused on IoT infrastructure, smart cities, and so on. Is it possible for the whole of the internet to have a state and for us to know at any given time uh, what the transactions are? And the great thing is, is that we could see what was the state last week and last year and so on. So we can instantly audit our, our ledger to see uh, where uh, things, things actually are. But one of the issues is obviously scalability and the transaction rate. Uh, <clears throat> and really, if we want to create a financial infrastructure for the future, we need to be processing at visa type rates. So Ethereum and, and Bitcoin and so on are still down uh, at the lower uh, reaches. But Ethereum is now trying to move up uh, the, uh, the processing speeds uh, using what are called sharding, creating little islands of, uh, of transactions. Because at, at, at one time, that's how we would transact. We'd have our own village and another village would have their own ledger and then any trading between uh, the ledgers would be recorded on another uh, ledger. So Ethereum is looking to maybe scale up by uh, creating uh, the sharding uh, approach. Ripple isn't quite a, 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 a blockchain type uh, method. It's really used for uh, transactions uh, 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 between uh, financial organizations but it has the scalability to really uh, uh, move, move up there. Okay, so what does this uh, look like? In our, trans our traditional transaction, what happens is that uh, we get uh, Alice's uh, bank uh, details, our account details and sort code. We then add that to a transaction. We give that to our bank that gets transferred to the other bank, and then ours is cred accredited for uh, uh, some money. We have a ledger, which will now say that, uh, that Bob uh, is down 10 here, and Alice is up 10 uh, pound uh, here. So the, the ledgers should all, all tally uh, together. In a Bitcoin world, there is no bank in between and there's no intermediate uh, entity. So in this case, uh, Bob just says that he would like to transfer uh, uh, some funds to Alice. He then signs with his private key and then puts it onto the ledger. But how, how do we know that that's a valid uh, 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 transaction? Does anybody know what problems could be caused uh, here that the miners have to uh, uh, identify? Yeah. 
think that there's enough uh, currency in the first place for the transaction to go forward, maybe. Yeah, yeah that's right. And another one? That uh, they could not agree on the continuation of the blockchain, so we have a split. Yep, yeah, yeah that, 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 that's, that's very true, yeah. Uh, but there's another one. So whether Bob has enough Bitcoin uh, in his account, and the other one? That it's going to the correct destination? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that they need to check that, yeah. Well, obviously one is that uh, double accounting. So if Bob, Bob has 10 Bitcoins and he very quickly creates, uh, creates two transactions for 10 Bitcoins, then each miner might think that it's okay, but he's actually double spent his, his, his amount in, in there. So each miner must see that there isn't any double accounting going on in the time that they're, they're mining. And as I said, that uh, Bob does have enough uh, uh, cryptocurrency in, in his account. Okay, so they get together and they agree. In a Bitcoin world, that's anybody and their dog. Whoever can buy enough GPUs and set up a big factory and consume lots of cheap electricity, uh, that happens. And it's not really a, a good uh, way to create a, a consensus. But it's worked for, uh, for 11 years and uh, and uh, we have at least proven uh, that, it, that, it, that it can operate. <clears throat> okay, so the basic history, 2009, uh, was created by Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, no central governments control it, uh, no broker to manage payments, uh, and, and so on. Uh, we can take it down to uh, these units here. Uh, this is called a Satoshi. Uh, and it's a kind of micro uh, amount. Okay, so it's designed to run out of, of currency uh, eventually, and eventually it was hoped that it would see its value and it would stabilize uh, and it could be used as a, as a replacement for, 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 for fiat currency. As I said, the rewards uh, reduces over time that the miners have and currently it's 12 and a half bitcoins but it's going to go down to six and a six point two five in may uh, time but it's not the only show in town and um, there are thousands of uh, cryptocurrencies uh, out there it just happens that bitcoin is the is the one that's worth uh, the most and many people try to make uh, money uh, from it so there's the genesis records uh, in there uh, hopefully we can actually have a look at that. So there we go. Uh, you can actually see it's a, it's a very small block size, tiny. Uh, we're up about one meg, one megabyte, uh, and I think we've increased two megabytes uh, for each block size. So they're quite small uh, blocks sizes, but the original one really didn't have any transactions in it, and it was really just there to, to try it out. But as I said, there's the zeros at the start and the miner had to do that. There's a difficulty level and as we'll see, it's a lot more difficult now because we have GPUs around. There's the nonce value that was, was used. There's the reward that, that was given uh, and, and so on. But that's the Genesis record and every, every uh, Bitcoin blockchain ever since has that uh, record uh, in it. Anyone, any, any questions up to now? Okay, so that's what we would typically see. Uh, so if you look at uh, my wallet, uh, so there we go, I don't know if you can see that. And there, okay, so there's a QR code to scan. And there I can define uh, the number of uh, uh, Bitcoins that I want to send to someone. I can add them as a contact, or I could just take a, a snapshot of that, of that uh, uh, QR code and, and then. And then the wallet itself has, has an address, as we'll see in a little minute, and we can see the number of transactions and, uh, and so on. So we'll have a look at this wallet here. It's pseudo-anonymized, so it's not anonymized at all. If I find out what your public uh, 
uh, Bitcoin addresses. I can trace every single transaction that you've ever made and I can probably find out where the transactions have went and so on. Uh, so there's good business in, in uh, law enforcement uh, software, which actually does this, uh, does this type of uh, analysis. A typical money laundering uh, uh, cyber criminal will, you will see often the trace of one transaction that they've got through ransomware becomes two, it goes into, an, into two wallets. Those two wallets then split into four and then it just gets distributed and then finally it goes it goes into the account and is cleaned uh, out from there that's a typical sign but you also have circular uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, transaction places i can send the money around to different wallets and then come back to the same wallet uh, again so obviously it gets a bad name because it's used for ransomware and cyber criminal uh, uh, activities, but there's nothing fundamentally wrong with uh, the transaction uh, methods. Uh, and there, uh, as I said, though that it's it's uh, uh, anonymized. Does anybody know of any any uh, ledgers, any cryptocurrencies that uh, provides privacy? There is Monero. What well, did, did you say, Monero? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Monero's one, and the Zcash is the other one. So obviously, what has happened is that some cyber criminals have moved from Bitcoin uh, towards uh, Zcash and, uh, and and Monero, which is which is un unfortunate uh, for that. Okay, and uh, we'll, we'll come back on to that uh, a little bit later. Okay, so you can see all the transactions and. Uh, uh, we can flip between dollar values and, and Bitcoin uh, from there. Okay, this is one of the largest ones that I could find here. Uh, so this wallet here has 94,000 Bitcoins in it or 600. Uh, 628 million, million uh, dollars uh, in it. So there's been quite a, quite a lot of uh, movement in, uh, in in Bitcoin. Typically, where exchanges have been taken over by 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 other companies, and obviously they're transferring the uh, the, the cryptocurrency out of one exchange uh, to to another company. But you can see there are some very large. Uh, amounts of uh, bitcoins uh, being uh, uh, tran transferred around the world. So there's that one there. That's a very large transaction. The fees are actually quite large, but not large in terms of what you would expect. If someone transferred uh, hundreds of millions, you would get charged quite a lot in, the, in a traditional network. In this case, they were charged over $400, uh, dollars, but that's still quite high from a cryptocurrency uh, uh, point of view uh, from, from, from there. Okay, so if we look at the, uh, the number of transactions, uh, so all kind of started uh, really around 2012 for a kind of takeoff. It hit the kind of peak of profitability and then it, it kind of slumped uh, a little bit, but it still, it seems to have found its its natural uh, place at about 300,000 transactions uh, per day. We can look at any given time uh, for the amount of uh, transactions on, on blockchain.com and it will give us peaks and, and, and troughs uh, from, from there. Transaction value, the total amount traded. Uh, these peaks tend to be where people are either cashing out or cashing in and, and so on. Uh, there was a lot of trading just a few days ago, uh, which caused Bitcoin to drop about 2000, but, but it's came back up uh, a bit. Uh, but you can see here, it's, it's, uh, it's the amount of transactions per day does, does uh, and vary. 
So there was a peak about 2018 and then a crash and then a real dip and it's kind of evened itself out, although it has dropped in the last few, few days, uh, but uh, generally coming back uh, up, up uh, again. Uh, it's rather unfortunate that the people are probably using it for profit rather than for, for uh, trading. Um, but uh, we'll see how uh, it goes and whether it is a contender for uh, other types of, of uh, currency. So there are lots of, uh, of different types of cryptocurrency. Uh, Bitcoin has the largest uh, capitalization. It's not big in terms of, uh, of the finance type market, uh, but Bitcoin sticks out much more and we see Ethereum and the rest actually coming uh, through in there. So there's, a, there's Ethereum uh, here. And if we actually have a look, I'll show you how many cryptocurrencies there are. <clears throat> and it just goes on and on and on. And anyone can can create their own uh, cryptocurrency if, if they want. Uh, so we can see down here, they're only worth $7,000 and so on. And uh, uh, And that's the range there. Uh, one thing you'll find for Ethereum is there's Ethereum Classic and Ethereum. Uh, so it can be a bit uh, confusing. And uh, that that was a hard fork of the cryptocurrency due to, to a hack on the Ethereum uh, exchange. Okay, does anybody have any questions up to now? Okay, so how does this all work out? <laughs> well, it's a bit confusing, uh, really. Uh, just let me move that there. Uh, I don't know if you can see that down the bottom. I can find, if I can move that. At the bottom, we've got our private key. So that's a 256-bit uh random value it must be random uh, and it's it's a 256 bit value uh, crazily we convert that into base 58 not base 64 but base 58 does anybody know why we convert it into base 58 it's so that uh, similar letters don't get confused i think that's right yeah so if you look at uh, here uh, the difficult letters are obviously zero and an O and, and a few other letters like an I and uh, a one and, and so on. So base 58 gets rid of some of those letters so that your private key is then stored in this, this base 58 format that has 58 characters that are quite easy to, to print and not, not be identified. Okay, this goes into your wallet and stays there, anybody who gets that will be able to hack your Bitcoins. The next part is our elliptic curve part. If you remember, we have a generator point and then we take our, our private key and then we add so many times until we get uh, our, our point on the elliptic curve, which is now uh, this point uh, here. This is our public key. Uh, and is defined as an XY point. So you can see it's a, a lot bigger than, than this one. And it's 512 bits because we have two 256 bit XY uh, coordinates that, uh, that we have for this, this uh, public key point. We then create a SHA-256 of this. We put it into another hashing method and it creates what's called the public uh, key ID. So when someone sends you Bitcoins, they send you that uh, ID. And that will allow the linkage back to the, the uh, private key. 
and automatically, because we use this elliptic curve uh, DSA or the key signing uh, here, then we can validate the transaction was signed by Bob without actually having to reveal uh, his, his public uh, key because the public key ID actually has uh, the linkage back to the private key. So it's a wonderful method and it works extremely well and we don't have to use digital certificates or anything uh, like that. I can create my new wallet, I can create my new key pair now and uh, I can start to, to use it uh, and it's almost impossible for anybody to come up with the same private key uh, ever again um, because there are so many different values here. Uh, I must say that uh, somebody sneakily uh, uh, went through low values of uh, of these private keys recently. Uh, some people do for testing. Uh, they might not create a random number, but test with a value of 10 as a private key. And some re recent research found there was there was actually cryptocurrency at some of these uh, addresses and they obviously cleaned out those accounts. Okay, so, so that's what our address actually looks like. So we see our public key ID in here. Uh, it typically starts with a one or a three at the start. Uh, there is the hash uh, value that uh, we use and we'll see uh, our, the details. Okay, so that's, that's it there. Public key uh, then becomes your uh, base 58 uh, key there. We create our elliptic curve uh, signature value, create a hash of that, and then eventually that becomes our Bitcoin public uh, address, and it links back to private key. So it kind of worked. And it works very well, and it's never really stopped from, from there. Okay, if we look at a wallet, uh, there's the private key, there's the public key value, there's the value that's in base 58 uh, that we store in the wallet, and there's the address. And whenever we sign for a transaction, we will see a value like that, and that will prove that the person has signed the and the transaction. The transaction itself is quite uh, simple. Uh, basically, we get uh, Bob's uh, public key, public ID, uh, and then Alice adds that in <coughs> into the into the transaction uh, and adds uh, her own uh, signature in there. She links back to a previous transaction to make sure that it's that. Um, uh, the transactions are, are linked and that becomes the transaction that's put on the, the blockchain. Okay, anyone, any, any questions? Right, I'll tell you what, what we'll do is that uh, we'll just have a little uh, quiz just now and uh, <coughs> we'll see. Right one, yeah. Okay, so if you could just uh, join uh, that Mentimeter. Hopefully this is going to work remotely. Oh, good, yeah, we've got one person. Good. So for payments, which method do you use? I, I must admit, I, I don't use any cash anymore and I struggle. <laughs> yeah, good, good, we've got one cash there. Okay, so I think we're generally moving towards a contactless and we still trust our credit cards, our piece of plastic uh, there. A few people use uh, Apple Pay, but uh, mainly we're moving towards uh, a contactless uh, payment system. I, I use uh, Google Pay for 
or mine. Good. Oh, the hand of Okay. So, what's your trust level in cryptocurrencies? Is it high, medium, low, or very low? Would you trust them? Would you put all your money into cryptocurrencies? Okay, so generally, that's <laughs> quite a spread. But we're kind of medium, we're medium there. Quite a few of us have very little uh, uh, trust in, in them. Uh, so it's unlikely that we would we'd put our mortgage or all our money into cryptocurrency, but maybe we might pay for a Starbucks coffee or something for it, as long as we knew that, that uh, it was it was limited from uh, in there. Okay, so if you were to buy cryptocurrency, I appreciate I haven't went into these methods yet. Which one would you probably go for? Okay, oh, good, good support for Ripple there. Bitcoin, Bitcoin mainly, Bitcoin mainly. Uh, I think it's went up about 15% in the last day or two. And I, you can't think of many uh, sort of currencies like that, but it also fell massively too. So uh, you must watch to use it as any sort of an investment. Okay, crypto mining is possible on your laptop or on your phone. And uh, the miners can create a little pool. Uh, and you could get paid back because you've got a GPU perhaps on your computer. And is it valid for a crypto miner to come in and use your computer if you were to get free coffee or something like that? Or you could get the reward and share the reward in a crypto mining network. What do you think? Do you think crypto mining is a, a really bad, evil thing? Or is it acceptable? <clears throat> That's interesting. Depends on the service. So many of you are not saying no. And it's just been given a very bad name. The first crypto miners uh, often had bugs in them. The, the, their CPU went up to 100%. Uh, now they're a, they're a bit more passive and they'll just come onto your machine and, and use maybe 10 or 20% of your, uh, of, your, your or of your CPU. Okay, so what do you think? Cryptocurrencies are mainly used by crypt criminals. They free people from banks. They're used for people hiding their tax return. They'll never take off, or they're a faster way of making payments. <laughs> Quite a choice there. Okay, so there's uh, mainly that uh, there's a feeling that cryptocurrency will free people from uh, banks and the transactions that they that they get involved with. A uh, few tax hiding, and a few <laughs> think they're for criminals. And obviously, uh, <laughs> they do have that uh, 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 appeal. Cryptocurrencies will never take off. Yeah, we've got a few in there, and the cryptocurrency fast away. So generally, I think we're looking at uh, there's quite a split of opinion uh, in them. Okay, so cryptocurrencies are the future, a bubble that will burst. Then we're going to match our existing finance infrastructure or a major risk for the future. Okay, so again, quite a split there. Many people see them as the future. Uh, uh, the uh, aid agencies are, are increasingly looking at uh, cryptocurrency to be able to get uh, to get funds to to disaster relief areas, because traditional ways uh, the banks uh, often take high fees and and will delay uh, lot lots of things. So so it's quite a quite a spread there bubble that will burst and the, the main thing is that you've got to divorce bitcoin and cryptocurrencies from blockchain okay i'll explain that in a bit more uh, detail but please don't think that they're the same thing cryptocurrencies could 
disappear, but blockchain uh, and DLT uh, will probably uh, continue. Okay, go on. Give me a word for cryptocurrency without using any swear words or anything, <laughs> anything like that. Oh, it's a key. Hype. Oh, hidden. <clears throat> Amazing. Volatile. Safe. Amazing. Hype. Hidden. Mine. Volatile. Volatile. Yeah, that's, that's very true. A confidence game. Cyberpunk. Wasteful. Drugs. <laughs> Privacy. Hidden money. <clears throat> Freedom. Anonymous. So now the tax. Uh, the HMRC now have a policy on uh, on uh, cryptocurrency for individuals, but not for uh, businesses uh, yet. So governments around the world are starting to to see that uh, they need to start to be looking at this as for tax type returns. Okay, unreliable. <laughs> Online, freedom, privacy, security, wasteful, safe, drugs, faster, virtual, cyberpunk, frauds, unreliable, confusing, uh, unstable, confidence game, ease. Good. Okay. Well, that, uh, that was, that was, that was uh, interesting. And, and uh, right. Okay. So we'll come back to our quiz a little bit uh, later for that uh so just pause for for breath uh, does anybody have anything to 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 say <coughs> at all we'll have we'll have a look at the chats the chats going <coughs> anything that uh, is any anyone anyone no okay uh we would typically have a break at this point, but I appreciate you can all go for a break whenever you want. So I'll just continue on if, if it's okay. I've got my coffee here, so I'm okay. We'll come back to the quiz a little bit later. Okay, so please keep uh, listening. Okay, so the mining process, as we saw, we have this uh, Merkle tree type thing. We create all the transactions, we hash, and then we create uh, uh, an overall hash, which is easy to compute for the whole of, of the tree. We can make sure that we understand how the ha all the hashes actually fit together. So for the mining process, what we do is that um, we create, the miners create a hash uh, for uh, the whole of, the, of, of the, the block. So each miner takes the, the transactions <coughs> and they will then race uh, to create the required hash that's going to be used for, for that block. As I said before, uh, each uh, block has the hash of the previous one and has a pointer to the hash of the, of the, of the next block. So it's all in, in, intertwined. Okay, on, on the Bitcoin network, there is a very wasteful infrastructure uh, of um, miners. And what we've got to watch is to defend against what's called the Sybil attack, where if uh, any of the miners can uh, a, 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 a verify at least 51% of all the transactions, then they can take over the whole of the network and actually define any transactions, delete them if they want, or add their own ones in and get the consensus there. So we need to make sure that that's a healthy pool <coughs> And that there isn't just one or two companies who could create a cartel uh, in the way that the banks would do, uh, and and they would they would pull the consensus towards them themselves. So at the current time, this is what uh, it looks like. You can see that there are very big miners here. I think they're mainly based in China for uh, inexpensive uh, electricity, but. Uh, <coughs> Anyone can can win uh, the 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 rewards. Uh, if we look at the big mining pool here, 
that's the one that's winning most of the most of the uh, the recent ones. That's one eighty one. I will not get that. There. Not getting to see the the ones that they actually were successful in. Uh, but uh, that that's generally uh, the, the the approach where we for the the, the miner will win the will win the actual reward uh, from there. <coughs> and then the hash rate uh, is something that uh, uh, increases the the computational complexity. So the more difficult the hash rate, uh, the bigger the challenge that there is, and obviously the more expensive it becomes because you've got to invest in CPUs and and, and so on. So the hash rate uh, has generally uh, increased exponentially over time. So it becomes more and more difficult as, as GPUs uh, come around, then, then the computational challenge for the miners becomes more and more difficult uh, and they're getting less and less rewards uh, each time so the miners will eventually uh, uh, dis well, disappear uh, in, in, the, in their current form. Okay so this is what happens is that uh, the miners will try, will take all the current transactions as a list and uh, check them and then they'll then add a nonce value in and re and compute the hash of all the transactions in the nonce and they keep doing that until they can find a hash value with a whole lot of zeros at the start. When they find that they will announce it and they will get the reward from the, the network and everyone will agree that that's the new hash and the block will be uh, laid down uh, like that. Okay, so here's our transaction here, and we can see uh, all of the zeros uh, in there, or the hashed value. And as the ha the hashing rate increases in its complexity, the number of zeros keeps uh, increasing uh, too. When we looked at the Genesis record, there wasn't a lot of zeros at the start. Uh, now there is there is many more uh, from from that, and I don't know if you can see that, but the block rewards down the bottom is is twelve and a half uh, in there. Uh, have a look at the size of the the block, uh, one megabyte, <laughs> one megabyte tiny. So we eventually filled up that on most so uh, on Bitcoin. It's about every eight to 10 minutes or so a new block is created. It's a bit like a train uh, with carriages. If the carriages all get filled up, then the train goes off. So what was happening was the train was filling up uh, and there were still transactions. So those transactions had to wait for our next block to come along, which isn't a, a good uh, sign. So there was a consensus that we increased it to two uh, megabytes to give a bit more space. And that's roughly where we are uh, just now. And we can see that the block sizes are about, are up to two, two megabytes. Okay, any questions up to now? Yeah, I have one. Um, why, like, what's the purpose of having so many zeros at the beginning of the hash uh, for the block? It in increases the complexity. Uh, it's actually quite a difficult uh, process You've, it's maybe one in a thousand billion times of creating yeah. a new hash. We add a new nonce and and we've got to find say 10 zeros at the start. And we've got to keep trying a nonce value until we can find that. Okay, thank you. Okay. that we never find one? Yeah, sorry, could you say that again? It's possible that the uh, nonce is never found and uh... Is there a plan for that? It should. Uh, the computation and the number of zeros required means that it's within the region of the time limits that you want the network to create a consensus. It's a very wasteful network. It takes the power of a country like Ireland for a whole year to run the Bitcoin network. 
so it's, it's very inefficient. So the consensus should be done quickly because people have made their transactions and they don't want to be waiting half an hour for that transaction to appear on, on the blockchain. So it's it's a careful balance and luckily it's it's watched up to now. Anyone else? Good. Okay, so what's uh, uh -huh. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. I've got a question which is distributed systems question. I can see that the previous transaction need to hash and um, need to sign and then also it need to connect to the next transaction. Right? It is like a linked list from what I see. How can you do a linked list in a distributed system? Is I struggle not to see additional lock methods or how can you actually make all those nodes agree on something and when they reach 51%, okay, we reached the threshold, we can move on. But from a system perspective, I struggle to understand exactly how it would happen. <clears throat> okay, so let, let, let's say we create uh, 10 consensus nodes and they're all ready to go. So they will gather uh, all of the transactions that have been made in the last 10 minutes that aren't included in a previous block. So let's say there are 100 transactions. So uh, the, the miners will then create all of those, hash them, and, and, uh, and, and create this overall Merkle hash, if we take all the transactions together, and then add an and then add a nonce value, like a random value, and recompute the overall hash. And we've got to try and get that to be, to have a set amount of zeros at the start for the hash value, just like in, it's like SHA-256, it's quite, we want uh, zeros there. And for most of the time, they won't be able to find that hash with all the zeros. So they just keep trying, trying and trying uh, until at least one of them will actually find the value. The hashing rate is set so that at least one of them will find within a good probability that nonce value for the overall block hash within a reasonable amount of time. Does that help at all? <laughs> Uh, no, I appreciate that. Thank you for that, uh, Bill. Uh, my question was m more about on how do I take this node and include in the blockchain with everyone else agreeing that this is actually a valid next node. Uh, in, uh, talking about the concurrency, I see a massive concurrency problem to be resolved in the blockchain because yeah. so you get all those nodes competing there. Yeah. Um, how they come and agree that actually, okay, I am the one that um, managed to resolve and um, therefore, you all have to agree that this is the, a valid value and not the one that was generated 10 milliseconds ago in China, for example. Yeah, so there's a the very strong time synchronization on, on this. And, and you're right, there can be a race. Uh, if I can get a number of nodes behind me to agree that I'm... So if, we, if me and you come up with the same hash, we now must race to get a consensus behind us. Uh, and the, the more miners I can get to agree, the, the more likely that I am, I, I will, will have the right ledger for those last 10 minutes. Uh, it, I mean, it is flawed because of that 10 minutes. And because I'll, I'll come back onto Hyperledger and some of the more recent approaches in Ethereum, which addresses the problem that you're highlighting. You must admit, you must accept that this is a first generation uh, blockchain and it, and it has so many uh, flaws. Uh, it's what's called proof of work, which means I can do the work to show you that, that I have the right answer. And the problem with that is that uh, it's consuming a, a lot of work. It's wasted. Uh, so maybe if I go on to Ethereum, that will explain some of the problems that we find here. 
Uh, so CryptoKitties was the first real application of a kind of a ecosystem, an e-commerce ecosystem, where you could buy a CryptoKitty, and that was a unique uh, digital artifact, a crypto artifact. You owned it; it had a life. You could sell it to whoever you want, and uh, and at one time people were uh, buying, and probably still do uh, these these kitties. So there's examples uh, here. Uh, you got your own uh, 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 crypto kitty, and you could put them on the market and buy buy them, and they, they generally had a had a had a, a life and. Uh, it created a marketplace within uh, Ethereum. <coughs> uh, but what happened though was that uh, there was real worries at the time that uh, the, uh, the Ethereum network had really hit its limit <coughs> when uh, cryptocurrencies came around and it was thought that uh, it couldn't cope with any more transactions and it was actually going to break uh, Ethereum. But since then it's, it's kept increasing and uh, uh, some people are looking to be able to make sure that it, it starts to scale. But you should always appreciate that there is a limit uh, to this, this type of uh, network for the amount of transactions that can be used. So Ethereum was uh, created by Vitalik. Uh, please watch any of his presentations uh, they're fairly inspirational, but he created it uh, only back in 2015 and it was built on the concept that we could actually start to run trusted contracts of the blockchain and not just have transactions there. Unfortunately, there was a hack uh, on the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the exchange and we had the choice because in a blockchain network, what you can do is you can do a rollback. So let's say you were hacked here. It's possible to roll the clock back and say that everything else is invalid and we go back to this time where we think that's the right. And the problem with that is that people, governments and so on, and people could actually start to say, I don't like that transaction. Let's roll it back. So your choices are to create a, a soft fork. So a soft fork is where you have uh, a, a, something new that you've added into it so that it becomes, uh, it, it implements new methods. Or you create a hard fork where you now define that this is now the new consensus and the old one really shouldn't be trusted uh, anymore. So they took the decision to create a hard fork and the, uh, they split Ethereum into two, uh, Ethereum and Ethereum uh, Classic, and they both went on uh, to, to develop their own uh, transaction network. Ethereum is in, is the, is sec in second place to, to Bitcoin, and Ethereum Classic, as we saw, is, 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 is much further down in the ranking. So the way it works is that uh, we have the concept of uh, gas. So gas is, is the cost. So rather than having all these miners and so on, you pay uh, miners gas to be able to compute things uh, for you. And one of the things in the gas is that they calculate uh, the hash uh, for you. Uh, so that the hash value is it's SHA-3 uh, is the method that we use here, or KITCHA uh, 256. And the miners will create the, the hash for the, the transaction. In order to uh, avoid a denial of service and to consume too much energy, uh, the miners pay uh, Pay, get paid with the amount of processing and also the amount of data. So this means that developers will have to try to keep the data small and also reduce the computational request or they'll get charged uh, gas. But it's almost like a pay-as-you-go uh, type uh, network where you pay for 
everything that you that you consume. Okay, so we get this concept of, of a gas, uh, and that's what the miners are actually paid uh, in for for that. Uh, the contracts are kept small so that they will be less costly uh, in terms of uh, them being uh, consumed. Okay, so uh, you, the miners get paid for the amount of kilobytes in the transaction, and there's a transaction fee uh, that's that's actually uh, created. Uh, you advertise for every uh, a bit of work that you want to do. You will advertise a certain amount of gas that you that you want to uh, pay the miners, and if it's attractive, the miners will go quickly to your, uh, your your data and can consume it. But the miners can never overcharge. They only charge for the amount of work that they actually do. So even though you advertise that your, that your work, your data will be a certain amount of uh, gas, uh, if the miner only consumes a small amount of that, then you won't get actually overcharged. But it's more attractive for the miners to to see uh, uh, something that has a high value. We'll be doing it in the lab uh, today, so hopefully you'll you'll see uh, for. It. So they give back any excess gas that they haven't actually uh, used uh, for that. Okay, so uh, so there's a gas amount, there's a gas price per transaction that's that's then uh, advertised. Okay, so this shows uh, the Ethereum uh, blockchain uh, here. Uh, and you can see there are quite a lot of transactions with inside of this, this block and there's, there's a, a nonce value in there. And these are what our Ethereum uh, transactions actually uh, look, look like. Yeah. Okay, so what Ethereum brought and what Vitalik brought was the concept of a smart contract. So it's now possible to create a contract between Bob and, and Alice and for that to run off the of the, the, the blockchain. So an example could be that uh, Bob makes a bet to Alice the bookie. So the smart contract would be created is that if Bob can actually prove that his bet is correct, then automatically he will receive the cryptocurrency without actually Alice having to uh, interact uh, with, with that. In Ethereum, uh, they're written in a programming language called uh, Solidity. Looks a little bit uh, like uh, JavaScript. And what we do is that we put uh, this code into a Solidity compiler, it could be an online one, or in Linux we can run a compa Solidity compiler. We feed that in and it creates a byte code. So if you remember uh, Java, Java creates a uh, byte code and that's trusted uh, code. Because we've got to watch that we, we create code which cannot be changed at all. So the last thing we want is Alice to go into our, our byte code and to change something so that she doesn't have to pay Bob and so on. So it's got to be highly trustworthy. So we put it into uh, this compiler and it'll produce the, the code that will run off the, the blockchain. So we can use this with uh, online uh, methods. Uh, so this is an example of, uh, of a Solidity compiler. So what we see here is our code. We then compile that and it creates the bytecode. The bytecode is the code that goes on to the uh, onto the blockchain and will run as a smart contract. Now, in order to make that a bit easier, we create what's called a Web3 deploy, which is a little bit of JavaScript that runs on the blockchain and applies the the, the bytecode uh, for us. Okay, so this is just a way for us to on our blockchain to put the contract. Uh, on, on, on there, uh, but that's the code here that actually runs. Anybody, any questions? 
No. And so you can envisage a future world in that uh, Bob, in this case, has an attestation that's signed to say he has diabetes by his uh, GP. Uh, it also has an attestation that he's over 60 years old and it's signed by a trusted entity. Okay, so we can have a place that we can keep public keys for each of these entities, such as the GP and for young Scott, and then they sign these things. These can then be used to run off smart contracts that would run off the blockchain. So in this case, uh, he gets free uh, bus travel uh, for this contract here. So automatically when he walks on the bus, then because he's got that attestation that is uh, over 60 years old, the smart contract runs and he gets free bus travel. He also gets uh, uh, his free medication because he has uh, diabetes or a discount from, from Boots, the chemist, uh, when he goes in there because he has that attestation. So smart contracts gives us the opportunity to be able to run thing, uh, things off the, the blockchain without them having to be stored away inside companies and, and so on. Okay, does that, anybody have any questions? Yeah, I have one. Um, is the gas price a cap or is there like, a, is it possible for the miners to request more gas if they need it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, if it costs more, they will consume uh, the amount of gas that's required. So developers need to watch that they don't have an infinite loop or they'll get charged uh, a lot of gas. Uh, so they need to be very careful not to consume too much. If you pitch a certain amount for uh, the gas value, and if it ends up being more, then you'll pay, pay that extra uh, from it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here's a future world. You've all heard of the seven layered OSI model. So here's the seven layer uh, model of the future. Uh, for for uh, finance uh, or for anything really. And look, we have our crypto layer uh, on, underneath. So we build on the cryptography, we make sure that the keys and so on and everything is all private at that lowest layer, but it does no good if we don't build strong software engineering to build onto that, that crypto layer. And then above that, we start to build ecosystems that really link down into that lowest layer of, uh, of, of crypto. As I showed you before, that's what the Merkle tree uh, looks like. So we can actually start uh, to build our data infrastructures using these trusted methods. We can find very quickly whether France is in our database or in, in, our, in our blockchain uh, almost uh, instantly. So we can audit at any given uh, time, uh, but obviously something that goes on the blockchain will stay on the blockchain, so we've got to watch uh, for privacy issues. So one, one model is that we could end up with a completely anonymized uh, uh, blockchain ledger uh, layer, and the good thing with that is that we'll have resilience, uh, that we can decimate a good part of the infrastructure, but it would still run and we can have data security to make sure that all the transactions are, are, <coughs> are valid, are, are private. Then it's possible for us to build layers on top of that. So we can have an anti-money laundering layer, we can have a healthcare layer, and if Bob has in his wallet a secret that will map back his identity to the anonymized uh, parts, then we could actually see how we could build whole ecosystems uh, through some sort of layering uh, to, uh, method. Okay, so that's what we've got. We use a private key to create the public key. We then use that to then sign uh, the transaction and Alice will be able to uh, prove that it was Bob's, uh, Bob actually uh, signed the, the transaction. Okay, the, uh, the way that it, that it works, as we saw with the electric curve, we have a private key, we create a, a public key uh, that, that Bob can then use to validate uh, 
uh, Alice's uh, identity. Okay, so there's the point of elliptic curve, that's our private key, and then that's the, the public key, which is a, a point on the, the elliptic curve. When we look at signing, we'll take a, a message and we create a hash of it. Uh, we then create uh, what's called a signature uh, here. So this is the private key and there's the public key. And we get these two signature values on every transaction of our, our actual signature. And in this way, we can instantly tell that it was Bob that actually uh, signed the, uh, the, 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 the transaction. Uh, so one problem that we have had on the Bitcoin network, so often transactions involve lots of people, uh, lots of accounts transferring into uh, a few accounts. And this is a very inefficient uh, method. So every single one of these public keys need to be checked against the, the signature that's actually created for the, uh, uh, the transaction. And what Bitcoin did was to int integrate this uh, multi-sig or a Schnorr uh, uh, signing network, where it's possible to take each of these uh, signatures and almost like add them together to create a single signing uh, entity. Almost instantly you can tell that it's valid and you, can, and you don't have to check each of the signers involved uh, in it. So this method vastly uh, improved the signing pro process. All of the miners agreed to this. So we had a soft fork and this is generally how the signing process actually happens on the, um, on the Bitcoin network now. Okay, so this is it here. Uh, we get what's called an aggregation of the key. Uh, basically takes all of the public keys together and creates a single signing uh, key uh, for it. So it's a bit like uh, if you had a number of directors in a company and maybe five directors had to sign a transaction and you had to include all of the, the, their keys, then the SNOR method allows you to be able to merge them all together and to create a single uh, signing key that will validate that each of them actually uh, agreed to the, the transaction. Okay, and it's uh, happened here. I think this was, uh, this was one of the first signing, uh, first blocks which integrated uh, the new <coughs> uh, uh, signing method. If you look here, there's the, there's the Merkle route that uh, we talked about from the uh, another method uh, that can be used and what's used in uh, Zcash is uh, ring signatures. So ring signatures are interested are interesting because you can actually create a number of signers uh, in a ring and then at the end of it you create a, a signature and you can't tell which of the signers actually signed it. But you do know that one of the signers, maybe you trust these signers, and you do know that one. In this way, we can keep uh, anonymity so that it's possible to either hide in a number of signers uh, or to create a trusted route so that you would know that at least one of the signers had signed uh, the things. So it gives anonymity, unforgettability, and collusion uh, resistance in, in, in them. So this is what uh, Zcash and other methods have actually used. And the way that you keep privacy is that Bob gathers together a few uh, a, a public keys of people that maybe have the same transaction value as Bob and gathers their uh, public keys together. And then he takes his own key, he adds his, uh, his own key onto it, and then no one will be able to find out who actually signed the uh, the, the transaction, but they know it will be valid and at least one signer has, has signed it. Uh, I wouldn't examine on this, but if you're interested, there's the kind of method that's actually used uh, for this, for that to actually uh, happen. 
The other thing that Zcash does, uh, so the ring signature gives an uh, anonymity of Bob, but how do we give anonymity to uh, Victor? <coughs> this is done by uh, creating a new uh, uh, crypto ID for Victor. So only Bob and Victor will know the ID of the account uh, which the transfer will actually uh, happen to. So they do this through electric curve to Hellman and they negotiate a new uh, place for the transaction to happen and then that money will be passed to that account and then obviously Victor can then do the same as Bob and transfer that uh, uh, cryptocurrency out uh, of there. So in this way we keep anonymity of the sender and also of the, the receiver. If you're interested, that's the way that it all kind of works, uh, but I wouldn't sort of go into any detail like this in, in an exam type question. Any questions up to now? Good, okay, so everything we've talked about is what's called permissionless public uh, blockchains. They often give uh, blockchain and DLT a bad name because anything that goes onto the public ledger stays there and anybody can put anything on it, good and bad and, and so on. But the future is likely to be towards private and permissioned uh, ledgers. So IBM created uh, Hyperledger and Hyperledger is a new approach to blockchains and really is probably the way that most companies would implement this infrastructure. You can run it on Amazon, Azure, and uh, whatever. And it's well set up and it's really got all of the things we talked about in a, in a nutshell, but it, it understands things like privacy and, and so on. So within Hyperledger, you've got to have a valid ID. You've got to be proven against a, an entity which you trust. So your identity might be proven by uh, maybe your Napier login or so on, but you need to come with an identity that is, is true and that no one can appear anonymized with inside the infrastructure uh, as they would on a, on a public blockchain. You then create your contracts and then there is a, uh, uh, a contract which is run uh, within a uh, side uh, a hyperledger uh, called chain code which will run the which will process the transactions. You then define your own peer network. So you might trust uh, your own peers and maybe Facebook and uh, maybe Google. So each of them could add in their own peers and we create a trust network that we know is valid. So we don't have these miners anymore. We have our own uh, peers, which will do the, the, the consensus amongst themselves. And hopefully they'll win. One of them is a, is, is a, is a, is a leader network. So let's say this is the leader and that leader has been well trusted in the past to give good uh, uh, good consensus and all of the other ones are just there to make sure that the leader doesn't get compromised uh, so we create a little network we have a leader the leader will generally lead the rest of the network but then if that was compromised then the others will create a new election process and kick that one off the network and they'll create their own consensus with hyperledger we create our own consensus network so if it's maybe five banks got together, each bank would add in their own consensus node to make sure there was fair play. Facebook is creating its own cryptocurrency, uh, Libra, and they initially created their consensus network, but it looks like some companies are actually leaving that. Uh, but certainly you can, you can define your own network. The good thing with these is that uh, we'll find later uh, where these are created through Docker. So Docker is an excellent uh, method. We create these peers with little Docker uh, com components, which can actually run and create that consensus network. Okay, so there's what we have. We have our components, uh, and these are Docker uh, agents that actually run, and then we have our ledger here. 
but it's a private uh, permissioned ledger. No one is allowed into it unless they have a valid ID. We can create everything as an asset and we can create key pairs. So it's very good for IoT devices uh, and so on, crypto assets and so on. We Everything, not just people, but assets have their own key pairs and are identified uh, uniquely. We have chain codes uh, for the code and we also have what are called channels. So each connection is defined through a unique channel. So if Bob talks to Alice, he, he talks through a single channel. Each end of the channel is, is approved and set up for each uh, connection. The great thing about Hyperledger is that it also allows a private area for data to be stored. <coughs> and it's possible for Bob to store all his private data without anyone else being able to get access to it. We can also create VMZs for data, which are a bit more public, and then um, things that are more public can be uh, shared across the community. So here's a, a, a graphic that uh, I took from the internet just to show the difference between Ethereum and, uh, and Hyperledger. Uh, and the main ones, there's a proof of work here. And this one uh, is the consensus is done through this, this uh, validating uh, network. The ledger is not public, but it's public for, for Ethereum. There's no cryptocurrency in there, does, and most of the applications don't involve any cryptocurrency. Uh, for Ethereum, we obviously have uh, Ether. Uh, the great thing with uh, uh, Hyperledger uh, is that it does Node.js or Go or Java, so it's a lot more, uh, uh, so it's just a lot easier to find code and so on. Go is the programming language created by Google, and it's a bit like C++, and uh, it's a lot more um, uh, flexible than, than other languages. And this one here is written in uh, Solidity. Uh, over here, we have a lot of uh, companies uh, really adopting it. Uh, Cisco, American Express, IBM, lots and lots of companies, massive amounts. The good thing, although it's created by IBM, is open source. So it's, it's led by uh, the developers themselves and by the community and not necessarily by uh, any big companies. Over here in, in Ethereum, we have a, a GP, JP Morgan, uh, some Santander are looking at uh, the Ethereum network. But many companies are looking at both, but it seems to be that Hyperledger is taking off mainly. And Hyperledger itself has uh, a, a different communities looking at different uh, things. Uh, from there, Fabric is used uh, quite, quite often. It's good for privacy support. Uh, we use uh, Hyperledger Indy here for our self-sovereign identity, and uh, Sawtooth is another one in here. So there's a whole ecosystem uh, being uh, created, and probably if we were to create uh, data infrastructures and in companies now, this is what it would look like, and we would have SQL databases and all that kind of thing that, that we have, and, and SSL and all these protocols that are, that are kind of old. Okay, so that, that's the end of our presentation. I, I know that was kind of long, but uh, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> no, no one. Good. <laughs> okay, so we'll go back to our, our little quiz again. Hopefully it's still running. And uh, we'll just continue on from there. Hopefully you're still uh, connected. Okay, so if you could just get yourself uh, connected again. <laughs> so luckily, luckily my cat has gone to sleep, so <laughs> you, won't, you, won't, you won't hear him. Good, okay. I think we're all ready to go. Oops. Oh, yeah. Okay. So give yourself a, a pseudonym.
Good. Everybody joins. Good. Okay, who was one of the cyberpunks? Al Finney, Eric Hughes, Ron Rivest, or Tim Burns Lee? Good, it was Eric Hughes. Uh, the photograph of the person I showed you was how funny. So Satoshi Nakamoto was sending a uh, sample code to how funny. How funny is well known for working in the cryptocurrency uh, community. I don't think he is Satoshi because he was receiving e emails uh, at, at, at the time. Uh, unfortunately, Hal uh, is, uh, died uh, a few years ago. Uh, and it was quite unfortunate that uh, that these uh, cyber criminals actually tried to uh, 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 set up extortion uh, things against uh, Ed Howe just as he, he was uh, as he was dying. So Eric Hughes is the is the right one. He was one of the cyberpunks and throw forward this whole revolution. So see that we've got Satoshi. Excellent. Uh, quite close there. Good. Okay. So Satoshi's in there. Where's where's Bob? Is is Bob on the line? Is Bob there? Do we have Bob? Maybe not. Okay, so for the next question. Who was the A in RSA? Leonard Adaman, Leonard Alderman, Len Ankerman, Larry Adaman, or Lizzie Adaman? Well done, it was Leonard Alderman. Uh, we have Revest, Shamir, and Alderman. So Satoshi is still top there. Donk, Scott, Helen, and so on. A bit of a distance here, a little bit. The fastest was this person. Okay, next one. Which is not a public key method? I say elliptic curve, El Gamma, or AES. The answer is yes, which is a symmetric key method. El Gamo, Elliptic Curve, and RSA are all public key encryption methods. Uh, most of what we do in, in blockchain is elliptic curve, but obviously with quantum computers, that elliptic curve is going to be at, at risk. <coughs> and Snowy Fox did well that time, uh, but it's still Satoshi at the top. Who's Satoshi? Do you want to unmute yourself? No. Okay. Excellent. We've got proof of work, which is good. Who co created Ethereum? Was it Vitalik Vitrum, Vitalik Vitrum, Vitrum Vitalik, or Vitrum Vitalik? Something like that. Have I got that? No. Okay, it was uh, Vitalik. Yeah, all done. <laughs> Why me? Did well there. Helen did very well. And it's still close, but uh, Satoshi is still top. Trent was the fastest there. Good. Next one, which is a permissioned blockchain. Hyperledger, Bitcoin, and Ethereum. Quickly, quickly, quickly. <laughs> Hyperledger is a permissioned blockchain. Ethereum and Bitcoin are permissionless. Anybody can do whatever they want on those networks. Uh, Hyperledger is permissioned.
Stonk, Stonk box did well there. Didn't change that much at the top. <laughs> Next one. Which country is introducing a blockchain act? Oh, that's an evil one. I didn't go over that one. Liechtenstein, Estonia, Finland, Jersey, or UK? It's Liechtenstein, of all places. Uh, so they introduced uh, some certainty and some regulation on, uh, on blockchain type operations, especially focused on cryptocurrencies. That may change it a little bit. Meow and cat, yeah, that's... <laughs> okay, so I think uh, Dratini is, is the one that seems to be going up, but Trent, who's Trent? Want to unmute yourself? No? Next one. Bob wants to send Alice some bitcoins. What key does he use to allow the transaction? His private key, his public key, Alice's private key, or Alice's public key? He uses his private key to make sure that uh, the transaction, only that key will allow the transaction. So we've got on. Oh, Trent didn't do as well that time. Satoshi is back at the top and Helen second. And then Trent, Meow and Kat is doing well there. <clears throat> Bob wants to send Alice some bitcoins. Which key does Alice use to prove the transaction? Prove it. Bob's private key, Bob's public key, Alice's private key, or Alice's public key. It's Bob's public key. So he signs with his private key and he'll prove to everyone that uh, he has that he has the, the, the private key with his public key. <clears throat> okay. It's still Satoshi. Top. <laughs> Roughly how many bits does an elliptic curve public key have? <coughs> 128, 256 bits, 512 or 1024. Okay, to 512 bits. Okay. Uh, to an x y point so it has two two points sorry one point an x and a y value so it's 512 bits so this should show quite a difference and maybe snowy fox trent is still top snowy fox is in there Aha, I just put this one in. There's token types. <laughs> this is a random one. Access tokens, security tokens, utility tokens, and payment tokens. It's like a random question. There's three types of tokens that you can create with your, with your blockchain. And it's access. You can get a utility token. Uh, it's a fairly random question. <laughs> And the Alan Katz did well there. Okay, Snowy Fox is top. And I think that might be uh, the end of it. Good. Snowy Fox, do you want to, to connect? Do you say hello? Hello, yes. Thank you. Well done. That, that was amazing. <laughs> uh, sorry about the last question. I apologize for that one. 
<clears throat> right, uh, does anybody have any questions on what we've actually uh, done as part of this, this lecture? Hopefully it should all be recorded and uh, and yep, so hopefully the recording is still going ahead. Yeah, the recording is still going ahead. Does anybody have any any questions? Nope. No. Good. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'll have a session on Monday evening. I might use uh, Zoom again uh, for that. Let's see. Any questions? No. Uh, right. What I intend to do now is uh, be here for uh, the lab. So there's a lab on, on, on the GitHub <clears throat> that you should uh, find. I'll send you the, the link. Uh, some, some basic uh, uh, setup for, for mining uh, the, the blockchain. And then it goes into a quite a kind of detailed setup for uh, Ethereum using uh, GEF. So it, it can be a bit difficult to set up. So see how you get on. I mean, obviously I wouldn't examine on anything like that, but it's quite good to set up your own your own uh, blockchain if, if you can. So what I'll do is uh, um, I'm gonna grab a coffee uh, just now, but I'll be uh, coming back. If you want to keep your camera uh, if you want to keep connected, then please stay connected. If you want to drop off, then please drop off if you want. Uh, I'm, on, I'm opening up Slack again. So if you want to contact me through Slack, then, then that's fine. But for the next two hours, then I'll be here. Uh, obviously, if you share your, your desktop, say with your Ubuntu machine, everyone else will see it. But hopefully that's okay, because everybody else can see what you're, what you're at, at, actually doing. And, uh, and everybody can hear what, what what you're asking. If you want to ask a private question about the lab, then just obviously contact me through 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 Slack. Is that is that okay uh, with everyone? So I'm going to grab a coffee, and once you're in the lab, uh, then then just just talk to me and share your screen. Uh, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll be waiting here for any any questions. Okay, well, th thank you so much, and I'm sorry about the challenge that this phase, this uh, this this medium actually have. You can see it's a very sunny day in Edinburgh just just now. A beautiful day here, <laughs> and I'm so sorry that uh, that we can't all be together uh, on on the campus and uh, really just make sure that you still uh, communicate and. And uh, hopefully your studies will go uh, amazing. Okay, well, th thanks very much. I'm just going to stay here, and uh, uh, I'm going to grab a coffee. So, so just just get back in contact with me when you have any problems with the lab. Okay, thanks. I'll I'll send the link to the to the PDF when I come back from coffee. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to stop the recording now.